to use this mic here because I tend to be a walker, so I won't. Is this, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I, not a member of Rotary, but I do have a happy story that I'd like to share with you before we get started. Uh, today's my oldest daughter's 34th birthday, but uh, more importantly than that, two weeks ago I was back in uh, New York City. She went back to college as a single mom at 29. Uh, was going to go to the University of Washington and then at the last minute decided to go to Columbia University in New York City and graduated two weeks ago Wednesday. So I'm, I'm real proud of her for that. Uh, she's got her degree in architecture and my two grandkids are loving New York even though they were born in Seattle and uh, so we'll see if we get them back. I'm not sure. But uh, with that as sort of a, a, an entree, I'd like to talk to you a little bit this morning. First of all, I want to thank you for coming out this early in the morning to hear about health care reform. I mean, uh, you have to be uh, uh, a little bit of a for punishment, I think, at times. But uh, we've had a law, as you know, that was passed a little over three years ago and has been implemented over time. And really the big, excuse me, the biggest stuff that comes uh, with part of this law is in 2014. And if you're an employer, you're probably aware of some of this, but even as an individual, you're going to be impacted by this as well. So just my standard little disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, I'm not trying to disseminate any legal information for you today, but try to give you some information as we've interpreted on the, uh, the law itself. So, uh, and then really, there's some things we hope that you walk out of here with today, and that's really kind of understanding in a broad base what the law is trying to accomplish and then how it impacts both businesses, uh, individuals, and uh, people who may be purchasing, purchasing their insurance in a different way than they've done it in the past. Uh, the Affordable Care Act of uh, 2010, which is what we call Obamacare or the health care reform law or whatever you know it by, really is, was designed to do uh, a number of things. One of that was to increase access through uh, a broadened insurance marketplace. Uh, there was going to be subsidies, and there are going to be subsidies for, for people with uh, lower incomes to be able to purchase care. Uh, it's going to be gu guaranteed coverage for all beginning on January 1st of 2014. And then uh, also there's an essential benefit package, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that has to be included in every health plan. And uh, hopefully this is going to, over time, lower consumer costs in health care. Um, next Saturday is my 34th year in this industry, and uh, I haven't seen costs go down in 34 years, so I'm optimistic they may slow down. Are they going to go backwards? I think that's a little optimistic, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll get uh, our arms around some of these costs. And then also quality is a, is a big part of this. We're not going to see a lot of that in the health care reform law, probably for another three or four years, because that's the provider side of this equation here, and they're rapidly, if, if you're aware in the community here, uh, you've seen MultiCare and, and the Franciscans buying up physician practices, trying to put together what we call accountable care organizations that are a part of the law. Basically what it is, is it's a sort of a, uh, a, a private enterprise approach to building what group health has had in this community for 50 years. So, um, And then an increased emphasis on preventive care as part of the, uh, the law as well. There are going to be new costs, no question, uh, in 2014. So even without any medical inflation or medical increases, uh, there would be more costs in this because of the tax that, uh, actually a couple of taxes we'll talk about that has been put into the, uh, the law here to help fund this. Um, so if you uh, are an employer, and then I'll talk about individuals kind of secondarily, but if you're an employer and you have more than 50 full-time equivalent employees, I'm not going to take you through the math on how they've done that, but uh, in this uh, meeting this morning, but uh, you have an, uh, an opportunity to decide whether you want to pay a, a penalty for not providing health insurance or to go ahead and, and play in the marketplace and, and provide health insurance. If you have less than 50 full-time employees, you get to make that same decision without the penalty. So uh, if you have a 30, 30 employee company and say, you know, I've been providing health insurance or maybe I'm not providing health insurance and I'm not going to. Uh, in uh, beginning of 2014, and if you're under that 50 threshold, you would not be subject to any kind of penalty. I think some of the impacting factors of whether employers particularly will continue to uh, uh, be an intermediary and, and help purchase insurance for their employees will be based 
partially on the culture of the organization and, and of course the cost. That's a, that's a huge deal. But uh, there are some industries, some of you have come out of uh, uh, circles where, it, you know, and, and what you do or what you did uh, really kind of dictated that health insurance be part of that benefits package that you work for. Uh, so I talked a little bit about that uh, on the 50, so I'll move ahead. Uh, in 2013, I'm just going to cover a couple things that we've had to do this year, and then really the, the bulk of what I want to talk about is 2014. And uh, if you're an employer and you issued more than 250 W-2 forms uh, for the uh, calendar year 2012, you know you had to provide a number on that W-2 that showed the amount paid for health insurance. That will eventually drift down to all employers, it was probably a couple of years away. Uh, a lot of people think that number is going to be used to tax you on your benefits. Uh, I can't say with certainty that will happen, but what I can say with certainty is in 2018, if you're getting your coverage through an employer and it exceeds a certain amount of money for the premium and that number if you're enrolled as a single employee is a little over $10,000, you will pay an excise tax of 40% of the amount over that $10,000, what we call the Cadillac tax. Cadillac tax has nothing to do with how rich the benefit plan is that you have. Uh, it's, it's tied to how much that plan costs. So some employers who may have a $1,000 deductible may in fact have a premium because of an aging workforce or whatever that's over $10,000 for an employee. And then you may have younger companies that have very high rich benefits but maybe don't even pre uh, approach that number because of the uh, age sex uh, category of their coverage that drives a lower premium if you will. But uh, anyway, uh, if, if you've gotten a W-2 or you didn't notice it when you did your taxes this year, if you happen to fall in that uh, uh, arena like I do, I work for an employer that has 6,000 employees nationally, so I, I saw a number in that box there. A uh, couple other things real quick is that the, uh, the government has uh, put out a standardized form of how we notify employees of benefits, and that'll be the same as if you're buying benefits as an individual through the exchange. It's an eight-page, 12-point uh, font uh, document, both sides, very, very standardized. Uh, so it looks uh, very legalese and very governmentese. And those have, those have been going on since uh, September of last year. Uh, there's also an increased Medicare tax that has kicked in here in 2013, which basically says if you're a high wage earner and you have a single household income of $200,000 or a uh, married or, or spousal community of 250000 you are going to continue to pay Medicare tax at a 0.9% of that amount over the, those amounts there as a Medicare tax. So if you're earning $500,000 in a household there and you're single, uh, you're subjecting that other $300,000 to about a little less than 1% tax that you'll pay there. Uh, and then those amounts are actually withheld uh, by the employer, so it's not a, a separate tax that you have to send in to do that. <coughs> There's going to be some health care plan fees. This applies to everybody. Uh, I'm often asked, this is all one for group plans, right? Employer plans. I buy an individual plan or, or whatever, so I'm not subject to these taxes that you are. And these taxes are basically for six years, beginning in 2012, the government started a uh, patient-centered outcome research tax in there where they're going to look at uh, hopefully bringing uh, clinical trials to a quicker uh, conclusion and get, getting these uh, practices out into the marketplace, hopefully the lower cost. Uh, you're being charged a dollar a year in 2012 for your plan. Uh, if you were uh, uh, also having a, a coverage for your dependents on there, there's a, a dollar for each dependent on, on your plan. In 2013, that moves to two dollars. So this year we're in that cycle and then that'll go on and it'll be based on health care expenditures until 2018. We don't expect that tax to get to be more than about $5 a year, so it's, it's not a huge deal, but the next tax is a huge deal. This is causing both employers, and again, if you're buying coverage as an individual through the exchange, and I'll talk about our exchange in a moment, you are going to pay this $5.25 per month tax for 2014. It'll go down a little bit in 2015 and down a little more in 2016 than it sunsets. But basically, if you may recall, the government uh, put together a high-risk pool back in uh, 2010 where they advanced funded $5 billion <coughs> for states to apply for high-risk monies. They thought that would last for two years. The fund ran out in 10 months. Uh, 
and but the goal is really to take back in $25 billion. 20 billion of that will be earmarked to help the exchanges initially here uh, with their high risk because we know in January of this year a lot of people have been denied coverage, particularly in individual markets, uh, are going to be enrolling and we're going to get some probably adverse risk uh, because of that. So there is some money that will be available there and then the other 5 billion is to pay the government back for that advance fund that they made. If you have an FSA at work, a flexible spending account, and you noticed in 2013 that that was capped at $2,500. Uh, and there used to be uh, employers providing way more than that tax-free for people to use on the, uh, the expenses of their health plan, like health pay deductibles and co-pays and those types of things. But this um, uh, Affordable Care Act uh, requires taxes to make it work. So uh, the government has stepped in and limited the amount of money free tax that you can put into a flexible spending account through your employer. The exchange itself uh, was initially required by employers to notify their employees of the exchange. And this requirement is on employers whether or not they provide health insurance or not. So I've had some employers say to me, well, you know, I don't uh, anticipate continuing paying for coverage beginning in 2014, or I'm not doing it now, and I'm not going to do it in the future. Employers still has to notify their employees of the existence of the exchange, even if they don't provide health insurance. That notice was supposed to be done on March 1st. Uh, how, uh, Health and Human Services back in D.C., uh, for lack of a better term, didn't have their act together, so they couldn't get this thing, uh, the model notice out. Now we expect that to happen sometime this summer, probably in late August, early September, and uh, that will also include uh, a lot of information on how those who may qualify for a subsidy would go about applying for that subsidy. So 2014, what really changes? And this is where the law really impacts everybody. In prior years, the law impacted some people, not everybody. But uh, 2014 is sort of the watershed that uh, everybody has to uh, uh, come into some kind of compliance for. The first thing is that we're not going to have any pre-existing or waiting periods that, uh, that are limited, uh, I mean, that are going to exceed 90 days. So if you're an employer, and you currently provide coverage and say, well, you know, I put people on my plan the first of the month after six months of employment. I have, you know, a lot of turnover. I want to make sure that they're going to stay. So I, I use a six-month qualification. Uh, for your full-time employees, beginning at your, your renewal in 2014, you'll only be able to have a 90-day maximum uh, probation or waiting period if you want. That's exactly 90 days, not first of the month following 90 days. So. Uh, that's one change in there. If you are an employer who employs a lot of uh, uh, part-time or variable hour employees, uh, there are some safe harbors there, but, but uh, you may have a seasonal employee that works enough hours that they may qualify for health insurance. And again, there's a huge mathematical equation behind that that I won't take you through. But uh, there is a way to determine whether or not that you have employees that you think may not be full-time, but if they work certain times of the year and, and certain hours uh, and meet that equation, they may in fact be full-time employed uh, for purposes of uh, providing health insurance. Uh, there's not going to be any end <coughs> limits uh, on plans beginning in 2014. Uh, so therefore, if you've had a coverage in the past, <coughs> my plan has a 2000, or, I'm sorry, $2 million lifetime maximum or whatever, there will be no maximum because the care will be unlimited uh, beginning in 2014 and then there'll be some restrictions on what limits can be allowed uh, in there for other things but there still be some restrictions on number of visits for certain types of coverages and whatnot you may have a 20 or 30 or 40 visit per calendar year for certain type, excuse me, certain types of services but uh, uh, you'll, you'll see mostly unlimited in, in most of these things as I said already the pre-existing condition goes away for everybody on January 1 so uh, previously, uh, only to 19 was the standard when we passed the law in 2010. But uh, beginning in January, all all comers, all conditions, uh, doesn't matter. And so that those will uh, go away. So wellness programs will start to become a focus, both in the individual markets and in the uh, group markets. And basically, you'll probably see some premium differentials. Uh, if you've ever bought life insurance in the past, you see smoker, non-smoker rates, if you're familiar with that type of thing, won't be able to discriminate based on gender, so there won't be higher rates for women over men or vice versa, depending on certain ages. 
the age discrimination factor goes away, but you can still charge more premium based on some healthy lifestyle attributes there. And we're definitely going to see that in the, in the exchange uh, where they'll have probably a smoker, non-smoker rate uh, in the individual markets. And I, when I talk about individual markets, I'm, I'm primarily talking about the under 65 non-Medicare. Medicare is a federal program not subject to the state exchange. Uh, we may see some changes in Medicare. You've seen in the news where Congress is all the time arguing about Medicare cuts or doing this, that, or the other. But uh, uh, to, to date, Medicare is not going to use that type of methodology yet. We're also going to limit the uh, out-of-pocket cost sharing that uh, uh, plans can have. So if you're a small employer, small being defined in the state of Washington with less than 50 employees, uh, the maximum deductible in a group plan that you're going to be able to have is a $2,000 deductible for a, a single or employee only coverage and a maximum of $4,000 per family. And then total out of pocket limits, uh, which include the deductible, won't be able to be uh, a family. So um, that's designed primarily, hopefully, not to bankrupt anybody on, on a catastrophic medical condition. We still know that for some families, those numbers are very high. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, they have put those in there. Those numbers were primarily, uh, if you have a high deductible health plan and you have a health savings account, those numbers were basically tied to what a health savings account allowed you to have. So, the individual mandate, everybody in this country who is here illegally or is a citizen has an obligation to pay for health insurance, either getting it through their employer, getting it uh, on their own through an exchange, or however, and if they don't, um, you will be subject to a penalty for that. There are no criminal penalties for not health, having health insurance, but there, there are some uh, monetary penalties that will be collected by the IRS. Uh, in 2014, if you decide not to have insurance, you get $95 per year penalty that year or 1% of your income. So Bill Gates can't say, well, I, I could probably afford any malady that never might ever come to me. So I'm not going to buy health insurance, but he's going to be subject to 1% of his income. That's a pretty big number. So I think that's going to motivate him to buy, buy insurance, just to keep him probably having to pay a million dollar penalty. In 2015, that goes up a little bit. Then in 2016, it goes up a little more. And that's per individual in your family capped at 300% of the penalty. So if you have a large family and you don't buy coverage for any of your family, it's a, a maximum of 300% of that 695. Uh, we're concerned that a lot of younger people will opt out of the system. I mean, at one time, everybody in this room, maybe somebody's not there yet, I'm not sure, but everybody in this room at one time was 21 and thought that they were going to be able to take on the world and nothing would ever happen to them. Uh, so they may not buy insurance uh, and pay the $95 penalty because probably their insurance coverage, even buying the lowest cost plan, will probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple hundred dollars a month. Uh, but 95 bucks a year is, is, a, is a little better deal. That pays for a motorcycle, it pays for lots of stuff. And, and uh, so we're hoping they will stay in, but uh, there are penalties at the point. Uh, the exchange that we set up here, we're one of 19 states that put together a state-run exchange. Uh, 25 states opted to let the federal government do it for them, and then there's seven others, I believe, working in partnership with that. That should add up to 51, because I'm talking about the District of Columbia, too. Um, but but uh, we are running a state exchange. The exchange in this state was one of the early adopters, meaning that we got some of the first federal monies to set this thing up. Um, this, though, by law in the legislature, has to be paid for uh, outside of the government. So the we can't use the general fund to support the exchange. So basically, it's going to be funded through insurers paying to play in the exchange. And then, of course, you saw some of the other penalties in the open enrollment for our exchange will start in October of this year. It will run uh, through actually the middle of February. Uh, coverage will begin on or after January 1st, depending on when you apply. So uh, those who are going to the exchange. Employers will also be able to buy in the exchange if you have less than 50 employees. Although the program that was primarily designed to facilitate that has been delayed by a year. And uh, we call it the shop plan, and, and that probably won't happen until 2015. Here's a little map if you're curious uh, uh, who's playing and, and uh, who's using the feds to do this. So it's uh, 
it's, it's kind of the heartland is that uh, we're going to let the government do it for us and the west and some of the upper northeast says uh, we'll build our own thank you so who can shop at the exchange and talk a little bit about both individuals and employers if you're on medicare you're not going to be buying your coverage through the exchange you're going to still buy that through uh, the way medicare handles everything so medicare has not changed but for those who are not eligible yet for Medicare that don't have a group plan, they will buy their coverage through the exchange uh, or opt to pay the penalty. And uh, basically, uh, that exchange will offer plans, I'll talk about it in a moment, uh, the types of plans that will be there. Uh, some will be eligible for a tax credit or subsidy there based on their income. So uh, you're going to hear something that sounds, uh, how are we doing? Uh, you're going to hear a term in the next few months about a qualified health plan, or QHP. Sounds like the home shopping network or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, a plan to be able to be offered in the exchange will have to be a QHP, which means that it meets a metals test. And that metal test, again, this sounds like the Olympics. I don't know. We've got some of these terminologies. But the, the least expensive plan will be what we call a bronze plan, then there's a silver, gold, and then platinum will be the highest coverage. And uh, basically, those are based on an actuarial value. Again, I won't take you through a long dissertation on what that means, but it has to provide at least a 6% <coughs> actuarial value uh, and meet those out-of-pocket limits that I talked about a little earlier. The essential benefit plans are benefits that have to be in the plan. Washington State's always been one that's adopted a lot of the, the mandates and all that. So this is not huge for us as a change. In other states, it is. Some states have excluded uh, or uh, highly diminished coverage in certain areas. I think the biggest one in Washington State is really the last one, pediatric services, which will now include some oral and vision services that previously weren't there. But most all this other stuff we've had for years in the state of Washington. So this is not uh, uh, too um, <coughs> onerous on us. Initially, the, uh, the exchange wanted to also have dental and vision and all of that, and there was the law doesn't require it. That was left out. And then I just put this up here. The exchange board is made up of 11 members. Uh, eight are appointed by the government, the governor, and then uh, uh, we have two ex officio members. So most of these people come out of private industry and, and that type of thing there. They're not all uh, uh, government people, but there's a fair amount of government representation on that exchange board as well. It's just thought you might be interested in knowing that. So the payer play that we talked about here for large employers, Again, you're going to have to offer a minimum essential plan, bronze, gold, silver, that type of thing. If you don't have uh, a certified QHP there, uh, your plan will be considered not affordable. And if it's considered not affordable and you're a large employer, then your employee will be allowed to go to the exchange and purchase coverage. And if they get a subsidy for that coverage, uh, the employer is going to be subject to a $2,000 or $3,000 penalty for every person that goes into the exchange to buy coverage for themselves if that plan doesn't meet that affordability clause. There's a secondary test to this that also says if the employee portion of the plan that they have to pay for on employee-only coverage exceeds 9.5% of their income, then they would also qualify for a subsidy. It uh, doesn't include any dependent costs. The employer is not being required to pay for dependent costs or worry about how much the employee might have to pay for that, but the penalties are all tied to basically employer employee coverage. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about this here, just uh, on what a large employer is and how that's determined. I'm gonna kind of move through that. And then uh, a little bit about uh, who's included in that full-time calculation. You don't have to, if you're an employer, you don't have to provide coverage for employees working outside of the United States or if you're a, uh, a subchapter or S corporation, you don't have to count shareholders as part of that or partners in a partnership, that type of thing. But, but for most people that uh, have uh, more than 50 full-time equivalent employees, they will have to make that decision whether or not to pay or play. And then I just put a little graph here on kind of how those penalties are derived. I, I won't take you through that for this particular thing here. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of what the law looks like. <laughs> What we're going to see, I think, beyond 2014, I'm asked a lot, what do you think is going to happen? I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think that in uh, 2000, probably 
17 or 18 when we get these accountable care organizations up and running where reimbursement is going to start changing from, from insurance companies to value-based type reimbursement rather than just straight financial reimbursement. So I think you're going to probably see if you're an employer plan, uh, and you may even see this in Medicare over time, where you will uh, choose not a provider, but you may choose a health delivery system like Franciscans, and they'll be your primary caregiver. You'll be able to probably move outside the Franciscans, <coughs> but you may have to pay more out of your pocket to do that. So as I said a little earlier, it's kind of quasi like a group health thing where you use group health providers, but this will be in the private sector. So I think they're going to continue to see in the, in the paper and the media uh, a lot of particularly hospital and health systems buying up doctor practices. If any of you in the room are physicians, uh, you're probably saying to yourself, yeah, you know, I'm getting pretty close to retirement. Maybe I'm just going to retire a little earlier than I thought because I'm going to be t probably taking on a whole bunch of patients that uh, I didn't intend on, on doing. I, I know a couple of uh, uh, providers that are over 55 that said, you know, I love doing what I'm doing, but, you know, if this thing gets to the point where I don't feel like I have that strong provider-patient relationship, I really don't want to be in this. I, I, I really like uh, uh, what I do, and I like serving the patient, but if this gets to be sort of a faceless patient, uh, maybe it's time to go. So we might see that. Any questions anybody 